that. We have one more song together as your congregation before pastor comes with the morning message. Let's go to song number 404. safe evermore. Praise the Lord. Let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. Kind of fun to have, uh, I mentioned uh, the youth outing yesterday and uh, I remember when uh, some of the kids that were in our church years ago, the only time they had ever seen me were, was when I was in uh, um, Juanito. Oh, there they go. Oh, my wife's taking care of them. Okay. Um, years ago, the, uh, the only time they'd ever seen me was at church, and I'd be wearing a suit. 
I went to their house one time wearing jeans, and they just kind of <laughs> stared at my jeans. And yesterday, Jerry, uh, 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 Romina, was uh, talking to somebody or doing something, and she kept staring at my wife because my wife had a baseball cap on. And she she goes in there and she has she teaches uh, what Jerry does with the, the kids at uh, Sunday school or right now it's morning service and uh, Romina was just looking at her. Finally, she said, "You're from church." <laughs> <laughs> she rec finally recognized her, but uh, kind of kind of fun to do that. <laughs> Hebrews chapter six got started on a story, and I didn't turn my own Bible to Hebrews. We want to look today, again, at uh, who God is. We're looking at uh, just going through uh, our God and getting to know Him better. We want to look today at how faithful He is. The faithfulness of God. Hebrews chapter 6, let's look at verse number, uh, start at verse number 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater... He swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Uh, we want to look at the faithfulness of God. I just want to make a point for those of you who are in Sunday school. Um, that I, as I'm reading here, it reminds me of what we're going to see in Sunday school. Not what we saw this morning or in the past, but we're looking at the book of Joshua in Sunday school. And as we read here about this hope, which hope we have as an anchor for the soul. In the book of Joshua, as the spies went to Rahab's house and they made a promise to, to Rahab, if you will be here in this house, you stay here, and everybody who is in your house... Uh, will be saved. We're going to come in and we're going to destroy uh, Jericho. But whoever is in your house, and they made this promise and they said, you, you uh, put out this scarlet thread and, and I'm being bombarded with this fly up here. Uh, that's because people leave the doors open, okay? So that's one of the reasons. Um, I'll try, I'll try to avoid it. I don't have my uh, fly swatter up here. No, I do. If I have to, I'll get it. Okay. Okay. Just in case. When they made the promise to Rahab, they said, put out this scarlet thread and so uh, we'll know which house it is. And anybody else will know also. Uh, this line of scarlet thread is what they said. The word line in the Old Testament can be translated hope. And so that was the hope that Rachel, Rachel, Rahab was secure in. That was their promise. So when we see the promise of God, we also have hope. And we'll see that as we go along. But God makes these statements, and we see that he says in verse number 18, that by two immutable things... That's that big word that mo many people don't know what it means, but it simply means unchangeable. Uh, uh, immutable means unchangeable. God does not change. So he says two immutable things, and there's been discussion, and I've looked at commentaries. I, I've, uh, I've tried to figure it out myself, and I came up with a conclusion. And I really like my conclusion better than the commentaries. I don't know if, you, if you've ever looked at commentaries and read or anything, but... It's like they copy each other. I don't know who did the first one, but it's like they say the same words, and I think, who are they looking at? But anyway, the two immutable things, the commentaries will say it's one immutable thing, unchangeable thing, is God's promise, and the other one is his oath. 
And I, to me, a promise is an oath. I don't see any difference between the two. It's not, it's, it's not two things. But he makes this statement uh, back in verse number um, 14. God says, Surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. Two promises that God made to Abraham. And those, uh, I believe, are the two unchangeable things. God says, I'm going to bless you. Then he says, I'm going to multiply you. And some people can link them together, but I think there's more to a blessing than just being uh, having a lot of uh, descendants. So I think, I believe it's uh, the immutable things, the unchangeable things. He says, as he goes on in verse 18, in which it was impossible for God to lie. We saw that in Sunday school. God's promises are sure. And when he makes a statement, it is absolute fact. When he makes a promise, he is going to carry his promise through. His faithfulness, the hope that we have, it says, is an anchor of the soul. We have fled for refuge in him to this hope that he promised, the, the eternal life that he promised. And he says that we might have a strong consolation in verse number 18. The word consolation is uh, the same word where we get the comforter, a paraclete, or paraclesis. It is comfort, and we are comforted by God and the hope that He promises us of eternal life. God is faithful. Because God is faithful, we trust Him. Uh, the, what does the word faithful mean? Uh, the word can be translated steadfastness. Um, solidly firm as if you were building a well Jesus said it when he gave the uh, uh, parable of the rich man and the not the rich man the wise man and the foolish man the foolish man built his house on the sand the wise man built his house on a rock why because the rock was not going to change the rock is not going to move and when the rains come and the floods come uh, it's not going to be washed away but the house on the sand is. So a firm foundation is what we recognize God is. Jesus Christ is the firm foundation. He is faithful in all that He says. And we can trust Him completely without reser <laughs> reservation. My words aren't going to come very good today. Okay, I almost said resurrection, but that's not the word I wanted. Reservation. Without doubt... Without doubting God, when God says something, we should recognize who He is. And He makes a statement, He makes a promise, we should never ever doubt, because doubting is bad. Uh, go over to Matthew chapter 14. When we think about, it's not Matthew 14, but uh, go to Matthew 14. And when we think about the sun rising, what is faithfulness? Is the sun faithful? How many of you, I mean, uh, my mom is probably the oldest person here, and no offense, mom, it just happens that way. Uh, I think I'm next. No, I'm not. But um, how many of you, no matter how old you are, how many of you have ever experienced a day where the sun did not rise? Oh, you might have clouds in the sky and you don't see the sun all day. But have you ever seen a day where the sun did not rise? No? At what point in the world's history did the sun not rise? Oh, it stopped and it backed up once, but it never didn't rise. So, tomorrow... If you wake up, do you think the sun's going to rise? Sure. It is faithful. Do you know there's a, there's a geyser in uh, Yellowstone National Park called Old Faithful? Why is it called Old Faithful? Because it, because it erupts at perfect regularity? No. But they can predict it. It's predictable in its regularity. But when you think of the sun... Or let's think of Old Faithful. Something there could change. It actually has changed uh, from 
the time they started recording it. It's, it's not every 90 minutes or so now, and it used to be 60. But they can predict it. But it can change. There could be an earthquake up there that just stops it. But God is faithful, and God will not change. God does not change. Look what, uh, as, as we see with Matthew, we're talking about trust and faith and doubt. Look what Jesus said to uh, Peter, verse number 31, And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Little faith, why did you doubt? I'm always amazed at this because Peter just got through doing what that you and I have never done? Walking on the water. He walked on the water, but he had little faith. He doubted at a certain time. Now, he had his eyes on Christ, but as soon as he took his eyes off and he looked at his circumstances, boom, he started to sink. Because he was trusting what? Trusting himself then. But when we keep our focus, our eyes on God, on Jesus Christ, we know that he is faithful. And we need to learn not uh, to doubt. Faith, absolute faith, is without doubting. Go over to Romans chapter 14. When we truly recognize who God is, how great God is, recognize His infinity of everything, we'll learn not to doubt. Look at what uh, Romans 14 and verse number 23 says. He that doubteth is damned if he eat. Now that doesn't mean if you doubt any time, doubt God any time, you're going to be sent to hell. The word damned, you, we've got to keep in mind. It can be condemned. You, you, are, you are actually, uh, it, well, that's it. Just, it's just wrong in doing it. Okay, that's what he's doing. He's condemning us for doubting. He that, he that doubteth is condemned for doubting. If he eat. We're not going to deal with eating meat and, and things like that. Because he eateth not of faith. And this is what I uh, want to point out. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So doubting is not of faith. So if doubting is not of faith and whatever is not of faith is sin, then doubting is sin. And we're talking about doubting God. We're not talking about doubting that <laughs> your, your friend if he makes a promise to you. We're talking about doubting God. Because when God makes a promise, it is absolute, trustworthy, and faithful. God is faithful. <coughs> every promise, every statement that God makes, you can stand on and be secure. Because God is what? God. Isaiah 25, verse 1 says, O Lord, Thou art my God, I will exalt Thee. I will praise Thy name, for Thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Now the word counsels can be uh, translated purposes. Your purposes are all true. What you have decided, what you want to do in my life and in the world are faithful. We can depend on God. Look over at Numbers 23. Numbers 23 and verse number 19. Now this is a prophecy of, of Balaam. Balaam wasn't a perfect person, but he was prophesying according to God's word. God told him what to say. So when God told Balaam what to say, this is one of the things he said. God, verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie. Boy, that's a big statement for us, isn't it? What does that tell you about man? 
<laughs> Can I ask a question? How many of you have ever lied? No, don't don't raise your hand. I mean, you might as well all raise your hand. Uh, men are men are capable of lying, but God is not. Man, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the Son of Man that he should repent. He hath said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Well, those are rhetorical questions. No, the answer is no. He's not going to change. He's not going to do something that he said he wasn't going to do. He's not going to do something that he said he was going to do. He's not going to not do it. God is a faithful God. God is absolutely faithful. We can depend on him. Go to the book of Joshua. When we look at the end of the book of Joshua, you, you, and I have done this, I've thought about this, as, as you look at the end of the book of Joshua, you see where the people did not fulfill everything that God wanted them to do. God told them to get rid of all the people in that land. Destroy them or get them out of the country. There should be nobody there except the children of Israel. Well, by the end of Joshua, it's not like that. There are still people around, still people that they haven't conquered. Uh, some people they made an agreement with and they had to leave them there. Uh, that one thing right in the very beginning that they, the, the Gibeonites, they left them there. <clears throat> Went against what God told them to do. So when Joshua makes this statement at the end of Joshua, we might think, well, wait a minute, not, not everything was fulfilled. Look at Joshua 23 and verse number 14. And behold, he's talking, Joshua speaking now, behold this day I am going the way of all the earth. That means he's going to die. And ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. Wait a minute. All the people, not all the people were gone, were they? Well, that wasn't God's failure. That was their failure. They messed up. They did not destroy all the people. But all of God's promises to them were fulfilled. And even as you go on in the book of Judges and, and, uh, and on in the history of Israel, God judges them because of their failures. But that was in God's promises also. God promised things that they failed to get because of their own sin, because of their own doubt. They did not live by faith. Go back to Hebrews chapter 6, and we see what the writer to the Hebrews said about Abraham again in verse number 15 it says and so now because God has made this promise and so after he had patiently endured he obtained the promise patiently endured uh, is, is like saying uh, well wait patiently or um holding back your anger until it's necessary. Have you ever been at a, a signal light? You're waiting at first person in line. You're, you're waiting for the light to, light to turn red. <laughs> light turns red, honk! Somebody behind you says, go! Yeah, I'm watching the light. You know what they're doing? They're not holding back. They're not patiently enduring. Abraham patiently endured. He waited. God made a promise to Abraham. And he waited and waited and waited. He was like 99 years old when uh, God made the promise to him about uh, um, Isaac. Go over to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 4. Abraham lived by faith. Abraham had troubles. God put him to the test. We know 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. 
It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God will with the temptation, now we're consider that temptation a testing, with the temptation, make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Abraham was tested, wasn't he? Romans chapter 4, look what, uh, what Paul says about Abraham and his faith. Look at verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. What's he saying there? Listen, Abraham was 99 years old. God says, by the, about this time, the time of life, I'll be back and you'll have a son. 99 years old. He, his body was dead, in a sense. It could not reproduce anymore. It, Sarah had already gone past her age. She couldn't reproduce anymore either. And that's why he says they didn't even think about, they didn't consider the fact that they were old. Now, in the beginning they did. Sarah laughed. Abraham wondered. But when they were 90, he was 99 and she was 79, I think. It's too late for life. And you're making a promise, God, that, that that I, I'm going to have a child? He patiently endured. He waited. He didn't even think at that time about his body being dead. No, God made a promise. God makes a promise, and I'm holding, I, I don't have to hold him to it. He holds, it to him, holds himself to it. Look at verse uh, 20, 20. He staggered not. What does that mean? He didn't doubt. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith. Well, that's, like you said earlier, not weak in faith. If you're not weak in faith, what are you? Oh, so-so. No, strong in faith. He was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what He, God, had promised, He, God, was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. You know what? Abraham did not have the thousands of years of looking at God working. Like we can look back at the sun rising. How far back? No, all the way back to the beginning. And we, we can be faithful. We know the sun is faithful. It's going to rise. We can look into Scripture and we can see the thousands of years that God has been making promises. Is that thing bothering you now? I can hear that speaker. I'm going to turn it off. It's bothering me. We can look at God's Word and we can see God working for thousands of years and we can trust Him because He's, he's proven Himself in Scripture. What did Abraham have? The only reason we have a... Not the only reason, I say... The reason we have Abraham's account is because Moses wrote it down. And that was a long time after Abraham was alive. What did Abraham have to look at? He only had God. And he trusted God without even seeing God working through thousands of years and thousands of millions of people. If Abraham could recognize the faithfulness of God way back then, what's stopping us? Why do we doubt? Why do we live by our own strength? God says, listen, trust me because I am the strong one, not you. I am the faithful one. When we realize who it is who's making the promises, and I mean when we realize who He is, we will have more faith. We will judge him faithful as Sarah did. God is faithful. God makes a promise of salvation. God made a promise of salvation long before the world began. We read it this morning in Titus. God promised salvation before he created the world. The plan of salvation was laid down in his mind even before... Adam was created. And so when he made that promise, who was he promising? 
He was promising you and me even though we didn't hear it. He made that promise to himself and he's holding himself to it. Salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, gives people salvation. Having faith in what God has promised. Look over at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 24. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. But well, he calls you, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. See, God wants all people to be saved. God calls out to the world. He says, I want to save you. He is faithful to do that when we come to Him. Look over at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse number 11. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with Him, we shall also live with Him. That means when we put our faith in Christ, we die with Him. Our sins are on the cross with Him. <clears throat> if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. That's not talking about Christians, okay? God will never deny a Christian. Uh, if, a, if a Christian, quote-unquote Christian, denies Christ, he's probably not a Christian. Because when somebody puts their faith in Christ, where's the full faith if they ever deny God? deny Christ. It's not there. So God will never deny a true Christian. If we believe not, yet He abideth faithful. He cannot deny Himself. He's not going to change. He says, this is the way of salvation. This is my promise to all mankind. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I gave you Jesus Christ. He died on the cross, took your sins and paid for them on the cross when He died. And I'm promising that if anybody who will believe in that and accept that as full payment for their sin, then I'm not going to deny my promise. I'm going to hold to it. God says that's the way of salvation. He's not changing it. Nobody, This world can't change the way of salvation because they decide, I think, I think there's more that I need to do. Okay, I believe in Jesus that died on the cross, but I need to also do... No, 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 no. The Bible doesn't say you also need something else. It's not there. God promised salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Only. That is the way of salvation. Uh, go over to Malachi chapter 3. Last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3. And uh, verse number 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Wow. They've turned away from him, but he never said, I'm going to destroy you. He never promised that they were going to destroy, he was going to wipe out the nation. So I, I change not. I made a promise, and I'm not going to do something that I didn't promise. God makes a promise of salvation through Jesus Christ. Look over at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And we'll start at verse number 14. Jesus, you know, is talking to Nicodemus and he's teaching him about who he is and why he came. And he says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, um, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. If you ever think about this, we think of John 3.16, that's a very clear statement. But all of these verses put together is really, it focuses down on 
on believing in Jesus Christ and nothing else. That's what it's talking about. And, and when people take and throw in all these other things, man, just look at this. He says it three or four times how somebody's saved. Uh, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in God's way of salvation. That's the way God has promised. Look at Hebrews chapter 6 again. And look at verse number 19. He says, which hope, talking about that hope again, we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, talking about the veil of the, the temple. The hope we have is an anchor of the soul. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you. An anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. That hope that God promises that salvation. We know the way of salvation. When we put our faith in... You know, if we didn't... If God was not faithful, if God changed, when could we ever be secure in our salvation? If He changes His mind, I can be lost tomorrow. But He doesn't. This is the way... And it's going to stay the way. Because God is faithful. Look at uh, Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. So many times the Bible tells us that God is faithful. We can trust in Him. We can depend on Him. Because of his faithfulness. Go over to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. And look at verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. These words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now remember, he's, he's saying all these things, and he's faithful to follow through with his promise. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all... Uh-oh. <laughs> wow. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. When we think about that, and say, boy, it's a good thing that God forgave me of my lies. Because when people reject Jesus Christ, they're not forgiven. 1 John 1 9 says, if we, forget, if we confess our sins, He is faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Even the lies that He hates. And, and here, the unbelieving are those people who do not trust in Jesus Christ, who have never put their faith in Christ for their salvation. Receiving Jesus Christ is the way of salvation, and it's faith. How, how can you prove? that you have eternal life. How can I prove to anybody that I know that I'm going to heaven? Or I shouldn't say that I know. How can I prove that I'm going to heaven when I die? Well, I have to go to the Scripture. But you know what? It's faith. I can't prove. I can't, I can't go and, and bring people with me and say, here, look. 
I have to believe. It's faith. Because God is faithful, I know it is a fact. The way of salvation is Jesus Christ. I have trusted Christ as my Savior, and by God's promises and His, and His faithfulness, I will be with Him forever. That's God's promise. That's God's faithfulness to all people. It's just that not all people accept it. God is faithful. We need to recognize that. We need to live by faith. The Bible says the just or the righteous shall live by their faith. And if we don't live by faith, then what are we doing? We're doubting. And doubting is sin. So we're either going to live by faith, or we're going to live by faith, we're going to doubt. We're going to live by faith, we're going to doubt. Just like the book of Judges. And God doesn't want this. Are we walking by faith? Or are we living in doubt? Maybe just a little bit. But we need to get rid of that little bit of doubt in our lives. Continue trusting God because He is faithful. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your faithfulness. Thank You that we can trust Your Word. And Lord, as we saw that in the book of Joshua, it's not just trusting Your Word because it's written down, but because of the God behind the Word. We can trust You because You're the strength behind Your Word that You've written down. Lord, I pray that You would give us the understanding to walk and live by faith because of your faithfulness to us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.